So gathering is a good thing. In the USA, with a slightly older group of people here, I'm thinking, um, there is currently um, a network called Dinner. Now, I don't think you've heard of Dinner, but Dinner uh, gathers people in groups of 12, usually under the age of 35, but over the age of 21. They don't know each other. It's not a religious gathering. But they pull them together around the base of people having unexplained or unexplored or undealt with loss, which is now haunting. So not therapy. The model actually is Alcoholics Anonymous. So I might go to a room, uh, to a dinner, and uh, somebody will have cooked, and I might say, well, you know, hello, my name is Martin. Uh, when I was 12, uh, my brother died in a boating accident, and my parents never let me grieve. And uh, now I'm living in this city. I don't know anybody. I don't go anywhere. All I go to is the gym. I don't know anybody there. And everybody around the table, having dinner, will say, hello, Martin, welcome. And we all get our chance to explore what's going on. Dinner has had over two million American kids, mid-twenties, up to thirties, already in about the seven years it's been running, which tells you an enormous amount about what our city spaces are doing to our young people. There they are working away, but struggling to make connections. This last book cover here is um, a wonderful book by uh, a woman called um, Abby Day. She's um, like me, an anthropologist um, and a sociologist. And um, rather like me, uh, she thinks slightly outside the box. So she decided that what she would do would be field work as an anthropologist amongst groups of women who baked in parishes, in the churches. You imagine the scene, can't you? Lots of women coming together, making scones, flapjacks, all kinds of other things, um, and nattering away. And she was fascinated with what this group did. They're all at a certain age, I mean, generally north of 70, hence uh, the last active Anglican generation. And what she observed was this. This group, of course, knew that it was clearly cheaper to go to Tesco's and get the three for two hot cross buns, because nobody can compete with the price. It is clearly economically nonsensical to divide your group up into somebody who goes and sources the organic flour, somebody who goes and sources the organic cherries, somebody who rolls out the marzipan, somebody who bakes the dough. But what happened? It was in the activity of the baking that all the decent social pastoral care took place. So at the end of this, you end up with some homemade cross buns. And somebody says, look, um, we haven't seen Martha for a couple of weeks. Did you know that her daughter had died very suddenly? Why don't you take these buns to her and see how she is? Or somebody else might say, look, you know, um, we've got more than we need here. Could you just pop round the corner to that old lady? because actually, um, I'm not sure I've seen her out of the shops this week. This group was the engine of pastoral care in the parish. I'm about to say to the vicar, it was a nuisance, because it cluttered up the kitchen, it got flour everywhere. These women seemed to be making incredibly expensive, time-consuming hot cross buns, where you could buy them cheaper at Tesco's. The point is, iniquity. Exchanges of conversation, of emotional territory, of need, and so forth, by gathering. And that meant, of course, that that group of women were, in some sense, a true congregation, a true church, because of what they were doing. When uh, Abby came to uh, leave uh, her group, having completed her field work, they gave her a lovely send-off. And like all good Anglicans, at the end of the send-off, they said to her, so of course we'll see you next week. And she said, no, 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 I, uh, I finished. They said, no, 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 everybody's a member of the group for life. You know, you'll never finish with us. She belonged. 
So here's a salutary lesson. This is from a wonderful uh, play by uh, David Power called Power of Yes. And it's about the difference between making money, managing money, and managing hospitals. And it just points out what you might call the obvious. If you're in business, well, the aim is to make money. But I doubt many jobs in finance are as hard as teaching a class of 14-year-old boys in a tough school. It goes on. Managing a hospital is rather more complex. It's hard to know what your objective is, isn't it? There's no money metric to help make the choice between better cancer or having better A&E. It's a judgment call. Running a hospital is an endless series of judgment calls where the criteria and objectives are very far from clear. Don't tell me that's easier than making money. Churches, congregations, temples, synagogues are brilliant because they lack clear objectives, but they understand the power of love, the polity of love, and something about the goodness of the politics of belonging. So here's what a colleague of mine says about religion. It's a rather dense quote. Um, I'll make sure you get this at the end. But just focus on the, uh, the words. They're places that intensify joy, confront suffering, make hopes and cross boundaries. All faith communities do that. They're all about intensifying joy, confronting suffering, making hopes and crossing boundaries. And in a world that's increasingly one of isolation and alienation, despite the fact that people are increasingly socially networked up. The irony is the more socially networked up our young people are, the less socially adept they are at meeting each other, hence the rise of dating apps and so forth. So I'm talking. So this is, um, I mean, a, a wonderful writer called Bruce Reed, and um, I just encourage you to, to grasp the essential point of this uh, quote. If bees could talk and we came across them in the flower garden, and we asked what they, what they were doing, their reply might be, gathering nectar to make honey. That's what the bees are doing, that's what they think they're doing. But if you ask the gardener, the gardener would say, they're cross-pollinating my flowers. <coughs> In carrying out what he calls their manifest function, they're performing a more important latent function, which they don't know about. The mutual dependence of bees and flowers is an analogue for religion or churches and society. Let me give you uh, a couple of examples of this from um, uh, my own life uh, when I was a curate in uh, Bedford. We had um, a, a large number of residential nursing homes in our parish because the houses were big and cheap and they were colonized by a number of companies that warehouse the elderly nurse. Um, one of our uh, congregation realized uh, very early on that the people who had uh, who were very elderly but with learning difficulties had a very low experience of life, didn't get out very much, nobody took them out and so forth. So he brought a minibus and started to gather them. The group was called Gold, growing old with learning difficulties. And the point of this group was basically to make cards and knickknacks for sale in charity shops. That's, if you like, the manifest function. It was going to be productive. But it's not the point of the group. What the group did, of course, was gather people around tea and buns and get them chatting. And what started off with one hour was became three hours and a whole morning, and the group grew and grew <coughs> and grew. Same church uh, realized very quickly that for older people entirely living on their own, the general practitioners, the about three or four uh, doctor's surgeries in the parish, had a real issue with the elderly forgetting uh, when to take their prescriptions, to collect them, or even what they were taking. So, of course, they would come back to the surgery time after time and say, you know, well, I, I'm not feeling better, did you take any drugs? I don't know, I can't remember. <coughs> parish sponsored a parish nurse. And the function of the parish nurse was to visit these people uh, to make sure they were okay. And of course, you could just do it in a minute, couldn't you? Open wide, 
pop the drugs in. Thank you, see you next week. It was never like that. <coughs> when you would go to the door, come in, have a cup of tea, I've just baked a cake. Um, oh yes, that's a picture of my grandson. Yes, I don't see you very much. So these visits take time. Because company is what combats loneliness. So there are the bees making their honey. I think we can go on to the next one. This is a poem from R.S. Thomas, middle of this, what is it to be human these days? Lonely. And my hand moved to erase it, but the voices of all those waiting at life's window cried out loud, it is true. This is what it's like to be lonely, sometimes. This is Mary Oliver's rather sagacious poem. And he says of sorrow. So what can you and I do? Well, actually, ordinary stuff, simple things, maintenance of communities, of charity shops, of places that gather. It's not big initiatives, it's sometimes just simple stuff. And if you look at that poem up there from Fanthorpe, it's very often about paying attention to the mundane details of people's lives. Have they collected their milk off the doorstep? Why is the post pump? What's going on? Haven't I seen them for a while? This too is uh, from another poet, Scott Cairns. Very much about just being good and uh, being outward facing. So this is a picture of uh, Benedict. Um, and uh, passing on his rule of life. Uh, again, uh, a foxy question I sometimes ask uh, undergraduates is what's the oldest constitution in the world that people still live by? And uh, students will guess uh, Houses of Parliament. They're really clever, they'll go for the Icelandic Parliament, which is older. But the answer is the rule of Benedict since the sixth century. And the first word is listen. And then it's all about how to tend for the hungry and the poor, the abbot out facing. So there we are, one nation amongst a bunch, of, a, a bunch of nations. Is it better to be alone and do things for yourself, or better to be together? The answer to that, I think, from all of the world's great faiths is we gather. We gather around hospitality, food, welcome, generosity, and therefore feasting and food is really important. And that in the end goes to the heart of one powerful image that Christians have. The breaking of bread is the breaking of pan, bread, from which we get the English word companion, breaking bread together. All of us have a calling and some social obligation to actually bring people together around food, around celebration, and around company. And that is becoming increasingly countercultural in our world today. But something I think that this group and everybody who's represented here, in terms of being a stakeholder, has an important and valuable contribution to make. Thank you very much.